This audio presentation of Dollars Want Me, The New Road to Opulence by Henry Harrison Brown. Born in Massachusetts in 1840, served in U.S. Volunteers during Civil War from August 1862 until October 1865. Taught school, worked under newspapers, lectured in various fields for 17 years, was seven years a Unitarian minister. I entered my present work of mental healing and teaching in 1893. Editor and publisher of Now since January 1900, I have thus gained by experience that which I teach in my books. I consider none of them of more immediate practical value than this little book. Grateful for the generous reception of former editions, I now send forth its revised and large edition, trusting it will also win me as many friends as the former has done. To all who would be free from the grind of labor. The editor of the delightful San Francisco magazine called Now has written a treatise on financial success, telling people to assert, dollars want me, every day, and to live in the thought that shining ore and rustling greenbacks are hurrying to find them. Any other desired object or aim may be treated in the same mental manner, while we also use practical methods to attain it. All the opulence of God belongs to his children. All happiness, peace, health, and usefulness belongs to us. God made no such thing as ill luck. Man made it by false conditions, false ideals, false thoughts, and false deeds. Ella Wheeler Wilcox, San Francisco Examiner. The dollar. This new law of Henry Harrison Brown's has given me new strength and power such as few could easily realize. O. Hashnu Hara, editor of Wings of Truth, London, England. I believe the idea that money wants you will help you to do the right mental condition. Be a pot of honey and let it come. Elizabeth Town, editor of Nautilus Magazine. Man's the elm and wealth the vine, staunch and strong the tendrils twine. Though the frail ringlets thee deceive, none from its stock that wine can reeve. The laws of this world are written out for him on every piece of money in his hand. Money which represents the prose of life is in its effect in laws as beautiful as roses. Not an instant would a dime remain a dime. In one it would become an eagle and another a copper cent. For the whole value of the dime is in knowing what to do with it. Money of it is of no value. It cannot spend itself. All depends on the skill of the spender. He needs no money, for he is value. Emerson Preface to the First Edition To the Reader This essay upon the dollar appeared in Now as one of the series of twelve lessons entitled Success and How I Won It Through Affirmation. It attracted much attention and drew out from its readers many letters. This appreciation has decided now folk to reprint it in form for wider circulation. This well conserves a purpose for which it is written. I wish to awaken my fellows to a sense of their present possession and help them the realization of the principle which controls life's expression so that living being to them a fine art, they will cease to look for happiness in some far-off heaven, but will enter into the enjoyment of the one they create here and now. It is believed that this little monograph and his first utterance of the thought that each individual has the ability so to radiate his mental forces that he can cause the dollar to feel him, lure him, seek him, and thus draw at will all things needed for his unfoldment from the universal supply. It will help you to rise above the drudgery of enforced labor and enable you to enter upon the manifold expressions of life under the joy of spontaneity of childhood. This is the thought which comes to you with this, my lesson of success. Henry Harrison Brown, San Francisco, California, May 1, 1903. Preface to the 30th edition. The constant and increasing demand for this modest booklet and the beneficent effect which it has had on thousands of its readers seems to justify its appearance in a new and enlarged form. May it also have a wider influence and enlarged power to free the mind of its readers from the tyranny of things. Henry Harrison Brown, San Francisco, March 1917. Chapter 1. Supply. He who dares assert the eye may calmly wait while hurrying fate meets his demands with sure supply. Helen Williams. Harmony. There is neither health nor prosperity without harmony. There is no peace, no health, where there is want. Be it want of material supply, wisdom supply, or love supply. Love, truth, and dollars. These are necessary to human well-being. Mind, body, and estate must be cared for. In order that there be health, happiness, and prosperity, there must be harmony. This harmony is found in merely giving self, the soul, its way. Harmony is living in obedience to mental law. It is found in right thinking. Bane of poverty. Poverty is the main cause of the unrest, the disease, or the unease that afflicts mankind. Remove poverty by right thinking, and all attendant evils will disappear. 
This right thinking means that there shall be on the part of the individual a change of attitude towards a dollar. Mental attitude. The prevalent attitude is want for the dollar. Belief that dollars are power. This must be outgrown and the attitude must be that all power is in man. Dollars are machines with power delegated to them by man. They are useless without man. Dollars want me is to be the thought of the coming man. A few so think now and obtain mastery of supply. Demand and supply. It is a legitimate demand on the part of each individual that he have enough. To supply human needs is the function of the universe. All is for man. The sun shines for him. The water runs for him. The flowers bloom for him. The grain ripens for him and the earth teems with beauty for him. All would be useless, would be purposeless, but for him. When he ceases to be, there is no use for the universe or anything in it. Without man, these are virtually non-existent. Man alone gives a meaning, a use, a value, a purpose to the universe. There is enough in the universal one from which all things materialize, for each one of us to have enough to meet all desires without robbing any. Infinite supply is all about us, and yet there is want. Who's the fault? Not of the one. It is in ourselves. We have not known how to claim, nor have we claimed our own. The Law of Supply The law is simple and is laid down by the greatest political economist as well as the greatest mental scientist the world has in its historic records. He was not a theologian, neither did he deal with questions of a future life, as many seem to think. He was a sociologist and a socialist. He dealt with a question, the life that is now. His name was Jesus. He gave the law thus, Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. Study the law. Analyze the law thus. Kingdom of God. Where? Within you. God is spirit, he said. The kingdom of God is then in the soul. It is the ego or soul of man. Know thyself as soul. Know thyself as spirit. This is a law. Live rightly is the meaning of his righteousness. Live in accord with your sense of right. Obey your own conscience. Then all things shall be yours. Things are whatever kind, of all kinds, are manifestations of the one substance. Things are, like yourself, manifestations of the one God. Dollars are things. Dollars are manifestations of the one God. The law is simple. Plain directions, these, live true to self, live spiritually. Give the first place in your thoughts to the eternal, from which things come and in all things will come to you at need. First, yes, not things first, but that mental condition which controls things. Not dollars first, but that mental attitude which attracts dollars. I trust myself. That mental condition is faith in self as a manifestation of omnipotence. Faith in self as a manifestation of the all-good. Faith in the universe as justice. Faith in the universal one as entirely good. Faith in the life are one. To draw its necessary supply of things demanded for its highest expression. Then let things come. This is all, but it is, God. This is straight gate. Few there be that enter it, but all may. Things are second. Few place things second. Dollars, position, influence, show. These in common thought come first. But these are the results of power. First become one with the power. Become the power. And these desired things will come. The ordinary process of business... The customary method of thinking is to be reversed. Think from inward power. Think from being. Be master. You will then be the master and things will take their right place. Become one with God by recognizing Him as King in your soul. Listen to Him in the edicts of your soul. Say as you thus become negative to the higher in you. Now God, do your work your way, and it will be done satisfactorily to me. No one can fail when he assumes his attitudes of love and trust. It would be an impotent God, and therefore no God, that did not work when these conditions are made. Poverty, how cured? Poverty is a mental condition. It can be cured only by the affirmation of power to cure. I am part of the one, and in the one, possess all, I possess all. Affirm this and patiently wait for the manifestation. You have sown the thought seed. Now, like the rancher, wait for the sprouting in the harvest. It can never fail you when, like him, you trust. Cure of poverty. Repeat this affirmation, no matter what the appearances, no matter if hungry, houseless, and alone, affirm, God is my supply. 
My supply is infinite. Dollars want me. Trust implicitly in the inviolable law of cause and effect. You are cause. Supply is the effect that must follow your affirmation. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. In the past you have sown poverty seeds, and you are now reaping the crop. You do not enjoy this harvest. Sow amid these results of previous sowing, plenty seeds, and plenty will come. Supply is yours when you sow supply seeds. So, no matter how seemingly black the conditions, the seeds have God in them, and they cannot fail. Affirmations for Use My supply is infinite, for God is my supply. Supply can never fail me. Make this your affirmation and hold it. Hold it. Supply is sure. The law of supply is as sure as gravity. In this affirmation, all is mine. Dollars want me. I have you have repolarized your aura. You have changed your vibrations, and you will draw as the magnet draws a needle, all you can use. Try it. Never let go of your trust that dollars, or that for which they stand will come. Thy kingdom, O soul, has come, and thy will is done, for God and soul are one. All is mine, tis but by asking, ere I make my silent plea. Life unlocks her richest treasures, for my waiting eyes to see. End of chapter. Chapter 2. Opulence you conquer fate by thought. If you think the fatal thought of men and institutions, you need never pull the trigger. The consequence of thinking inevitably follows. Carlyle. The dollar side. Personal ideals of necessity must differ, yet, since money represents objective power, its consideration must enter as a factor into every ideal of success. Money represents supply. It stands in our thought for food, clothing, and shelter, for books, pictures, and companionship for enjoyment, unfoldment, and expression. Material supply is the necessity of life. The dollar is the concrete representation of the necessity, but the dollar also means opportunity for the realization of high ideals. The individuals must be free, and until the necessities of life are assured, he is not free. Personal liberty. Thus the dollar stands for individual liberty. Personal liberty finds its basis in pecuniary independence, Financial independence and personal liberty bear very largely the relation of cause and effect. We can almost say that in popular mind the dollar confers liberty. In soul culture, a mental attitude of superiority of the dollar results in personal liberty. There is no liberty to him who feels himself limited by the want of the dollar. Debt is one of the most tyrannical of masters. McKay well says, The debtor is ever a shame-faced dog with his creditor's name on his collar. There can be no liberty to him who feels the slavery of debt. Ideals of Success Into your ideal of success, therefore, must be firmly built this ideal of pecuniary independence. This independence does not lie in freedom from debt, neither does it lie in large bank accounts nor the possession of property. Monetary success and personal liberty do not go hand in hand. Indeed, the average man of wealth is the veriest slave, enslaved to the necessities that his monetary possessions involve, and a worse slave to his fears. What is success? Success lies in the mental attitude that arises from the sense of personal power, which meets every condition without anxiety. That cannot be called success, which results in ill health and unhappiness, unrest or fear. Eliminate these from your ideal and you have, as a necessary commitment of success, financial ease. The New Thought In the old competitive thought, men sought business and wanted the dollar. Under the New Thought it is, Seek first the kingdom of God, and its right living and all things necessary to my happiness will be added unto me. The soul has only to exercise its drawing power. When the conscious mind lets itself be led or drawn, it will be drawn to what it desires. Desire is the magnet. Let it have its way. Trust in your own love of truth and love of goodness and never question. That you desire it is enough. That you desire it is evidence that it already exists for you on the soul side. Be passive to the desire and let it manifest. This attitude is itself success. What to think? Think positively. Things belong to me. I am already possessor. They will come to me at need. Then let them come. If they do not readily come, hold no anxious thoughts about them. Having accepted truth that all is mine, and that all desired conditions or things will manifest, keep on working in an equitable, confident frame of mind, and let them come. Anxiety, doubt, mistrust show that you have not claimed them as realities, but you have held them as dreams or possibilities. 
until you hold them as realities, they cannot come. The right mental attitude. Change your attitude toward business. Do not seek it. See it mentally already yours and let it come. Attend yourself to details as they come to the surface. Consider business a principle that will run as runs a mountain stream. When you remove your conscious will from it, all your concern is to be ready to use this business stream as the ranchman uses the water as it comes to his ditch. There is but one power, and that is the universal, the infinite power. Business is power. Business is a manifestation of the one power. Use power as does the telegrapher. Let it come and then direct it. The wisdom for the day comes with the day. Let it come by having faith in self. Work each moment as if it what you desire were here and it is here. Place of money. As to money, regard it also as merely the power that keeps business going. Welcome its coming and rejoice as it's going. It never does its work until, like the water in the stream, it is passed under the wheel. The hoarded dollar does not work and is of no value to you. The dollar you spend is the only one you really have, for by the experience of spending it, you gain a growth, an enlargement that is yours forever. You are power. Money has only delegated power. You direct its expression. Change your attitude toward money. It is not the almighty dollar. Almighty power uses the dollar. Say to the dollar, I do not need you, you need me. You are of no use until my brain and hands use you. You wish to be used. You come to me that you may be used. I do not need a dollar. Dollars need me. Assume this mental attitude and see what a change it makes for you. For you will have changed your aura. Dollars will draw on. You need not think of their coming, for they will come to you through the opportunities which this new mental attitude revealed to you. Think only of using them. Mental Attitude Towards Dollars Change your attitude towards the dollars you have. Tell them they are of no use until they are expended. As you see them lying about, say to them, Idle dollars go to work. Go out and circulate. Each one of you go and pay a million in wages and debts. When I need you, come back again. You are useless and have no value until you go to work. Then let them go to work, knowing that, when you send this thought with them, they and their fellows will come back to you to be set at work. Spend the dollars. Before you spend a dollar, the question comes, is it right? Whether you have a single dollar or whether behind the one you think of spending are a million makes no difference. If it is right to spend the dollar in the proposed way, had you the million, it is right thus to spend this, the loan one. Therefore, when you feel it is right to spend a dollar for any purpose, spend it as royally as if you were a millionaire. From the inner life, this message was given to me years ago. Let a thought of use stand guard over your purse and then spend freely. Amend this by affirming, a thought of the righteousness of the spending stands guard over my dollars, and I send them forth with blessing. Thoughts do the work. These dollars, like every thought of good you send out, will return to bless. You do business with thoughts only, dollars but materialize thoughts. Each dollar in any man's hand represents his thought in material form. Send out at all times with your dollars the thought you wish to return to you. For what you sow in your dollars, you reap in dollars that either do or do not come back to you. Put the thought of success, happiness, and health into every dollar that passes out and it will return so laden. Pulls of thought. Having acquired the proper mental attitude, there is something necessary for you to do to draw the dollar. Your magnet of desire must have two poles. First, you must have something which the world needs and is willing to pay for. In this respect, you must follow the law of supply and demand. You must honestly feel that you will give the dollar's worth for every dollar that you desire. Secondly, you must, in all sincerity, dedicate every dollar that comes to you to noble service. You can then feel that dollars want you, that through them, you can give what you have of value to the world. Feel that dollars wish you to use them for the accomplishment of your purpose to use them justly. With this ideal, you can conscientiously invite dollars and they will come. They need your heart, brain, and hand that you may benefit the world. What are dollars? Dollars are manifestations of the one infinite substance as they are. But unlike you, they are not self-conscious. They have no power till you give them power. Make them feel this through your thought vibrations as you feel the importance of your work. They will then come to you to be used. They will not come, nor can you in this thought draw them to be hoarded. Use, helpfulness, and happiness must be in your thought of success. This held firmly, perseveringly, as your affirmation will turn the current of dollars your way. What to think? 
Your thought should be, I possess that which the world wants. Dollars want me to use them. Dollars want me in scattering that which I have to bless. Use these affirmations persistently. Dollars love me. Dollars want me. I am ready to use dollars, and they freely come to me to be used. Make a low limit as to the amount. Claim abundance. Claim all you can use for good. All that is needed to enable you to be useful and happy. Abundant supply be your demand. End of chapter. Chapter 3. Time a Factor In all your self-culture, you do remember that time is a necessary factor in unfoldment. It is not a measure of duration. This mistake of measuring time by a figure on a dial will never do in this culture. Time is to be measured by growth. Some may grow more while the hands count 24 hours than others in 10 times that. Take no thought of time. You have all there is. You are spirit, or mind if you prefer the word, and have all eternity. Seeds require time to germinate, grow, leave bud, bloom, blossom, and fruit. Each thought, each change in your ideal is a seed. It will follow nature's line of evolution. You will require time as you change your attitude. A period will be required to change your vibrations so that the dollars will feel you and learn that it wants you. This period will vary according to the power of concentration and your fidelity to your ideal is couched in the affirmation, dollars want me. The thought feel is first to be clear to the weeds of the old thought sowing and the seeds of the new must germinate and bear fruit in the garden of supply. Forget the past. Pay no attention to the old conditions. Keep at your affirmation, knowing it is the gate to the reservoir and every irrigating ditch will soon be full of water and can come down from the reservoir to it. I want. The echo, I want dollars, must become still before the real sound of dollars want me can vibrate in your aura. Know, as the merchant knows, that he was that which the people want, that you have that which dollars want, in your thought, in your hand, in your life. Advertise your purpose to the dollar. Tell it that it wants all these that without you it has no power, that without you it can do nothing. Tell it that all it wants you have, that it will come to you that may accomplish its mission. Then, like a patient merchant, wait for your customers. Dollars will soon flock. As do customers to a bargain counter, the want column has attracted them. Use here only the same common sense, perseverance, and patience the successful businessman uses, and the dollar will find their wants supplied in you, and you will find supply. End of chapter. Chapter 4. Fundamental Considerations The Consciousness of Want God hid the whole world in thy heart, says Emerson. This fact man has been long in perceiving. From caveman to twentieth-century millionaire, the propelling force has been a consciousness of lack. I want food, said primitive man. This drove him to activity and led him to unfoldment, for it awakened in him a consciousness of his ability to supply that want. It led him to recognize the fact that food already existed, he did not, however, reach our higher viewpoint. Neither has the twentieth century millionaire reached it, for he still shares that primeval ignorance and says, I want dollars. This little book is a call to him to leave the primeval attitude and come up into this higher plane where he will hear the world's work calling to him, I want you. Necessitate the spur to unfoldment. In the development of man, necessity has been a big incentive. Necessity has driven the wheels of progress. Animals also feel the spur of necessity, but there is in man a plus, the imagination, a psychic quality, which has been a stronger factor in his development than has been animal necessity. This power of imagination differentiates him from the animals, lifts him above the animal plane, and makes him man. The ideal. It was imagination that led cavemen to paint his face and to carve pictures on bones. The ideal, the haunting dream of the better, floating before him, has lured him onto thought and action. From the animal matrix, the power of the ideal drew forth the human. Necessity drives, the ideal draws. As the ideal develops, so does its power to draw develop. When man in his unfoldment shall have left the animal entirely behind, he will know no necessity, but when in all ways live from the ideal. Then there will be neither necessity nor want. Brutes want, man has. Human possibility. The human soul possesses potentiality all possible powers, like heat and coal. This power in man waits for expression. Power in coal or steam waits for opportunity for expression, but man makes his opportunity. Power needs man. As fast as man learns that the power in coal, electricity, or radium waits for him to use it, he puts them to use and learns that from all eternity they have waited for the thought necessary to direct them and work for him. 
all things await man's thought. All progress is but a change of mental attitude toward conditions that exist. A weed is a plant man does not know the use of, says Emerson. So the condition, whatever it be, that is today untoward, when man knows how to use it, will be found favorable. There are millions of weeds waiting for man to learn their use. Weeds want man. They will tell their secret to the listening ear. Weeds as well as roses live for our happiness. The ideal leads to discoveries. Desire for something new led man to find coloring matter in that which were useless weeds, to find food in others, and in others clothing and building materials. Plants, minerals, and unknown forces are still waiting for man to use them. Man is ever to think, new forces want me. Love of the ideal. Love for the ideal leads to desire. Desire leads to action. Action converts untoward conditions into the actual ideal. In the old thought, man was controlled by want. He was ignorant of his place and power in nature. In this thought of want he labored. I, even in his religious life, he wrought in the want of heaven. But the fact is, heaven holds out rewards for man, because it wants him. Want is a lack of manhood. Want is born from the non-intelligence of the brute, which man has not yet outgrown. The individual, conscious of his power, does not want. He knows that whatever is needed for his health, happiness, and unfoldment already is. All he needs to know is where and how to get it. The psalmist said in a most matter-of-fact way, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why? Because the power that called him into being prepared conditions for him before he came. Jesus saw the same truth in the realization that he was an integral part of the universe. He said, I and my Father are one. All things that my Father hath are mine. And he had learned how to get them. He could not lack. He knew his power. Even the wind and the sea obeyed him. Nature's Demand Things for man and not man for things. Whoever realizes this truth cannot want. All nature wants him, is constantly bidding for him, and even lying in wait for him. Opportunities are ever present for man to use. Power in things which represent power at all times present for his unfolding into consciousness of himself as being, as a child of infinite wisdom. The constant enlargement of this consciousness causes a constant change of mental attitude, so that man learns to use opportunities and conditions instead of being used by them. Worth of a man. When once an individual has reached this consciousness of himself, he realizes the value of Emerson's admonition. Let a man know his worth and keep things under his feet. Let him not peep or steal or skulk about and down like a charity boy, a bastard, or an interloper in the world which exists for him. He will know that all that is is for the unfolding into consciousness of the embryo God which he is. Following the ideal, he will follow into love his ideal, and there will constantly open fields of activity that want him. There will constantly be more power asking him to harness it. In radium he is finding only the promise of future knowledge, a vaster use. Power is an atmosphere that cannot be limited or lessened. In consciousness of himself, as power to use power, man will not seek to possess things, but will learn to use things. Thus will the law be fulfilled. Seek first the kingdom, then will things be added. No life waste. This truth perceived, man will not waste life in hoarding and clinging to things. Each day he will use in love everything that is his to use, and thus will develop his power to draw other things that want him to use them. He will gradually unfold the ability to see and improve the incessant opportunities that force themselves upon him. He will come to know that nature wants his thought and love to help her express her latent forces, which are merely waiting for the hand of man to loose for his use. Nothing has value save that which adds to man's health, happiness, or usefulness. Said James Freeman Clark, Nature writes upon all her works, service to man. Inventions The power of the inventions of Watt, Stevenson, Edison, and Langley to revolutionize civilization is small compared with the transforming power flowing through the mental attitude expressed in the thought, Things want me. Dollars want me. Nature wants me. God wants me. Power of Truth Every new perception of truth causes changes in every line of thought and endeavor. Not an avenue of human expression, but was changed by Copernicus and by Darwin, Wallace, and Spencer. The truth that a tan is wanted will work a greater advancement in spiritual welfare than these perceptions of scientists and philosophers have wrought in material and intellectual good. Universal Principle The principle is universal. 
Man must entirely reverse his attitude toward nature, himself and things. He must recognize that, at the crowning expression of infinite power, he is to accept his place as the ruler, and he is to exercise dominion over all things. He must affirm, the world exists for me, it is for my use, it has no other use than to minister to me. Without me there is no purpose, no ultimate in nature. Social change. There can never be a happy and equitable condition in society until the present attitude of want is changed. Whenever the race shall affirm, things want me, then the millennium will be near. Man will then see that he is infinite in his possibilities, that time and things are simply the means by which he comes into consciousness of his own divinity and immortality. That change comes to each individual where he learns to affirm in truth, I possess, in place of, as he now says, I want. Dollars want me, in place of, I want dollars. Great is the change. This change is so great that when proposed to the average man, he no more sees the principle and its import than would the boy by Franklin's side have understood it. Had Franklin said that the lightning which was drawing from the sky would run streetcars and drive automobiles and airplanes, dollars want me, will work at no less marvelous change in the world's social life. Criticism. I am aware that the principles of this little book are an easy mark for the humorous or satirical pen of the superficial critic. Plain as my point of view is, the blind critic can easily miss it, and the point of view is all important. The position of the book. I affirm the infinite possibilities of the human soul. I have faith in man as power to overcome all limitations and to realize that he is able, through expressing his divinity, to have dominion over all nature. He will have this as fast as he learns his power. I affirm that there is but one power, one mind. All phenomena are but a manifestation of the one, the self-conscious manifestation of that mind, man, because he is self-conscious, has power to command obedience from all that is not self-conscious, to command all that is not himself. Money, being a part of all, and also being a creation of human thought, is subject to human will. All this my critic may not accept, and consequently he will look from the old thought point of view. Having no thought in common, he cannot agree with me. Work in practice. Do you wish to know the truth of these principles? Practice them and await results. The final test is always, by their fruits ye shall know them. Practice is necessary. No ideal can be reached without great effort. Your desire must be accompanied by earnest work. Indolence will never draw. The magnet works or will not draw the needle. Thought is work. Concentration and will and effort are necessary. Plan and stick. Accept the principle and then, as the architect plans and concentrates on his work till his house rises complete, for otherwise it would be a medley. So one must build an ideal of opulence and stick to it, no matter what comes until he actualizes his ideal into the objective. It is no easy task to develop the faith that moves dollars, but it is easier to endure the poverty. Let one be a persistent in thinking and declaring I am rich, as he has been in declaring I am poor. Let him with equal persistency say, I have dollars, as he has been saying, I want dollars. I will promise him that he will grow into that mental attitude of perception that will see and take advantage of opportunities to earn the dollars that lie all about him now unperceived. No man can do his best under the thought of poverty, under a thought of want. Knowing his ability, the workman does his best. Under fear, doubt, mistrust, he can never do good work. The poor workman quarrels with his tools. The good workman knows he has the power and uses the best advantage his tools. It is always the mental attitude that determines success. Let that attitude be, business wants me. An instance of success. A gentleman in my class in Boston who furnished a noon lunch into hundred said, Mr. Brown, I don't understand how dollars want me. Why did you select that location for your business, I asked. Because it was at the center of business district and there was an opportunity for me, he answered. Surely, I said. You have answered my question. You went there because business called you. Business wanted you. You said, men want dinners and I go to furnish them. He saw the point, applied it, and thinking thereafter, men want dinners. Drew men and increased his business. We radiate a mental atmosphere that is sensed and is potent. He who says, I want your dollars, repels you. He who says, you want my goods and I'm glad to serve you, draws business. Rockefeller when you realize the power of mind through concentration and right thinking, you will see that the great financiers each unconsciously applied the law which this book teaches. 
I have this instance from some mere reminiscence which Mr. Rockefeller has published. As our success began, I seldom put my head upon my pillow at night without speaking a few words to myself in this wise. Now a little success. Soon you will fall down. Soon you will be overthrown, because you think you are quite a merchant. Look out, or you will lose your head. Go steady. These intimate conversations with myself, I am sure, had a great influence on my life. I was afraid I could not stand prosperity, and I tried to teach myself not to get puffed up with any foolish notions. Talk to yourself. Treat yourself as teacher and pupil, as doctor and patient. With constraining directness, make your affirmations to yourself. Only thus can you open up the sources of infinite power that are within you. This talking is best done in formulas, positively expressing, I am. End of chapter. Chapter 5. Affirmations for Success. The teaching of preceding pages have been necessary that you, my reader, may fully understand the principle of affirmation. Now I will give you some examples in the way of affirmations that, if you will repeat them until it becomes a habit for you to think along their lines of thought as automatically and persistently as you have on the old lines, will so completely change your life expression that you will, in comparison with your past, seem like a new person. What to avoid? Avoid negative expression. Never you wor use words that are not in line with your desire. Here are three example impressions to avoid. I cannot afford it. It is common when one desires a thing and does not feel that he can expend the cash for it to say, I cannot afford it. For what are the dollars in your purse? To spend. Can you afford to spend them? Is it not for that which you have them? You do not mean that you cannot afford it. This thought makes you the servant of the dollar. What you really mean is, I do not feel that this thing is the one I can best buy now. I prefer to use the dollar in other ways. This is the proper attitude of mind. In it you continue to be the master and the dollar is subject to your decision. This may seem like a little thing, but it is the most important thought you can apply in your career for success. It is, dollars want me. Thought and not the thought. I want dollars to tell me what I shall do with them. A gentleman once said to me, I'd like to buy some of your books, but I cannot afford it. Excuse me, said I, you smoke ten cent cigars. Certainly, was his reply, at least five a day. Sure, he said, you can afford them? I do. Then you will pardon me. You should have said, I can afford to buy some books if I decide, but I prefer to spend a dollar for cigars. This is your privilege. Exercise your personal liberty and be master of your pocketbook and say, I spend the dollars I desire. I have spent so much. This is a second bad expression. Have you spent or exchanged that which represented value for something of value which it stood for? You bought a suit of clothes. Twenty dollars exchange for clothes. In taking on account a stock, you only change twenty dollars from cash account to assets. Your account balance is the same. Investment. Another way to look at money expended is as an investment. Fifty dollars invested in mining stock and you look for dividends. So invest every dollar that passes out of your hands. It is an investment in education, in health and experience. Feel thus toward the dollar as they go and then your mental attitude will be so clear that you will see opportunities for other investments that will bring sure dear dividends. Regret, sorrow, fears, remorse, and all such attitudes of mind so cloud the judgment that other effects similar to these regretted will follow. Happy, peaceful, contented, trustful, self-respectful mental states keep the reason. Conscious in judgment, clear and proper investment will be made under them. Always see a dividend coming in from every dollar that goes from your purse. The greatest of all dividends is experience, for it is ever afterward a mental asset that increases the value of every decision. I've lost so much. This is the third bad expression, is akin to the spending idea, but worse. Away with it. The lesson learned is worth at all cost. Nature always gives measure for measure. So much experience for future guidance is always adequate recompense. All one gets out of life is a result of experience. Experience is the expression of life. The pressing out of life into consciousness. All our present consciousness is a result of experience. The presence is but adding, through experience, to the sum total of our consciousness. So is it true that we act with all our past and think in the present. For this reason, no one has any cause to regret or repent or to be sorry for any experience. One is today in consciousness all that he has expressed of the infinite possibilities of the soul. Let him say, I have always expressed as my reason, my desire and my will have determined. I have learned by experience what expression bring happiness and what misery. According to my power to choose, to decide and to persist, have I used the experience. Because of my use of dollars, I learn how to use them if I am wise. If I do not learn, 
then the want which I allow myself to feel for the dollar will be the cause of more suffering. Once one has mastered that want by realizing the principles set down in this book, he will feel no sorrow over lost dollars, for he will know that the dollar spent, or the dollar others call lost, is his as experience forever. End of chapter. Chapter 6. Financial Freedom Financial freedom is a real desire which actuates men in their labors for the dollar. That freedom will never come as long as one puts in the dollar any power to add to, or to detract from his happiness, until he realizes that it is his attitude towards the use of the dollar that will bring satisfaction. There will always be the cry of want. Affirmations I therefore recommend that the following affirmations be used till the mental attitude they express becomes habitual. I desire a deep consciousness of financial freedom. I desire that a flow of prosperity become equalized. I desire a greater consciousness of my power to attract the dollar. I desire a constant success in my business. When you have used these until you are conscious of a definiteness in your desire, you may use the following. I have a deeper consciousness of financial freedom. I am financially free. Dollars want me. The indwelling power cares for my purse. I have whatever I desire. I have no question of expenditure. What I feel I need, that I purchase. I can afford to use dollars for my happiness. I have clothes, food, books, entertainment, and whatever I need for health, happiness, friendship, and service to others. Here is another which may be developed with the assistance of a friend for myself in time of my own weakness. I must always say to myself, I am financially free. I must see it that the two men, the material and the spiritual, that I am, shall blend to the purpose of financial success. I see myself in such a financial condition that the money is always there, actually, vividly there, to use freely and in fullness. I always have a good bank account. I actually see it. My one idea of the law is to use, use, and use. I insist most rigidly upon using my law most persistently until I have my full demonstration. I have strength of character, stamina, backbone, powerful purpose, and accomplishing. I demonstrate that I'll have my home, funds for business, for recreation, and for any improvements in myself. I affirm real emancipation, real freedom to make the very best in my life. End of chapter. Chapter 7. An Editor's Opinion O Hashnu Hara, editor of Wings on Truth, London, in the April 1903, number of that journalism has this to say of the law of opulence. The February issue of now contained an article on opulence. I have read a good many articles on opulence. Some have impressed me, some fell flat, flat as a pancake. This one did not. First of all, it's placed all my former theories in a wrong light. My idea was to say I want. It is quite true that when I did this, I generally got what I wanted sooner or later. But if H.B. says that you must not say I want, in effect, he says you must affirm, I do not want dollars, dollars want me. H.H.B. is right. A very little consideration will show this is right. But consideration wasn't enough for me. I put it to the test. The first five days, my receipts fell almost to zero. But I was determined to hang on. I felt it was right that the drop in my business was due to the readjustment of the vibrations. For long experience has taught me that you cannot turn around from one method of thought to another very suddenly without disturbing the currents. And these have to get readjusted to the new rate of vibration before you can work them. The sixth day, my patience was amply rewarded. For every one order that I had been in the habit of receiving, I got twenty, and it has kept up ever since. The Honey Pot Now, I never weaken my position by affirming that I want anything. I say it wants me, and I know it will come. It is not any use making a statement. Of course, if you doubt it, you must back up your statement with faith and feel it is already yours. It is rather on the principle of the honey pot and the swarm of summer flies. You are the pot of honey. The dollars are the flies. Now the honey doesn't worry about the flies. It is content to be sweet, to give off a faint sweet smell and to stick. But the flies do want. They come from all quarters. They swarm into it, sip its sweetness, and buzz all around. The honey is a power, irresistible power so far as flies go. They want. It is a greater center of attraction. Now say you run some particular line of business. You are the honey. In the world there are many people who want what you have to give them who will gladly pay cash for it, who cannot help being attracted to your honey, as the flies might be. Thought is power. 
Your thought is strong and potent beyond measure, but when you assume the wanting attitude, although you do most certainly attract, it is nothing like the powerful attraction formed by your quiet, confident attitude of absolute conviction that the thing wants you. The attitude of desire is strong, but the attitude of certainty, of possession, which is new thought makes possible is wonderful, and a veritable tower of strength. It has made things possible to me that were quite out of the question before. End of chapter. End of book.